So as you can see that delta mu or the <coughs> chemical potential difference is in the last lecture as was discussing is a function of <coughs> the chemical potential difference delta mu here is a function of the uh, driving force right d equals to minus d, uh, d equals to minus delta mu right so driving force is minus delta mu and delta mu is a function of t and p and as you can see when i simplify i take delta cp which is the delta cp is the uh, uh, heat capacity difference between alpha phase and beta phase so i am considering the alpha to beta transformation i'm just giving a quick reprise <coughs> And then also there is this delta S0, delta S0 is the uh, difference entropy at the uh, standard state. Standard state is defined by 0 superscript is defined by our transformation temperature. Transformation temperature is the temperature at which alpha and beta are in equilibrium. And also there is T minus TR, right? There is T minus TR and uh, this TTR basically is the transition temperature. This is the transition temperature at which alpha and beta are in equilibrium right alpha and beta are in equilibrium when we write alpha and beta in equilibrium we use this symbol reversible symbol right and <clears throat> you have also uh, if you if, when you did the algebra you could get delta cp tl and t by tr now if you see delta t is t minus t um, uh, t tr or uh, uh, t minus t transmission temperature means there is a transmission temperature so this is t tr which is the transmission temperature and this is some temperature away from the transmission temperature but if delta t is small then this ln term can be approximated further so for example i can write uh, t minus tr by tr so t minus tr by tr uh, if i do then um, basically i can write this ln 1 plus delta t by tr and then it's the logarithm and this is very small so basically i can expand on uh, the expand this logarithmic series about this delta t by tr um, means t tr t and the subscript is tr right so t tr which is the transmission temperature so delta t is the means how far away is my temperature from the transmission temperature now if this delta t that is the 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 the, the deviation from the transmission temperature is small then i can use this ln 1 plus delta t. so basically t by tr is written as 1 plus delta t by tr uh, t is, uh, tr and then basically i am taking only the first power of it right and uh, so basically the first power is delta t by t tr and right t transmission so delta t by t transmission and so that's what i have done so i can remove the ln part right and you have the C, uh, delta vm0 that is again zero basically denotes the standard that is the standard means the standard uh, state here the standard state here is taken to be the transformation temperature ttr and uh, 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 say some p0 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 is the standard pressure p0 can be one bar one atmosphere uh, whichever you, you want to so you can you can take some p0 and you can take the transformation temperature itself right to define the standard state or the zero right it's the super if you look at the superscript zero superscript zero stands for transformation temperature and p0 pressure right now <coughs> as you know delta is zero that is the is the difference in entropy of alpha and beta between alpha and beta difference entropy between alpha and beta in the standard state is related to the difference in enthalpy by the transformation temperature ttr right so and as we know that we can basically write this as i told you that we have only the we have taken only the first term so basically ln 1 plus x is x plus x square by 2 factorial plus so on but i am taking only delta t by t uh, transformation because delta t by t transformation is very very small because the different the the the, the delta t that i am taking is uh, delta t is really really small right so it's a very small deviation from the transformation temperature so as a result delta t, t by t transformation is very small right we can only take the first uh, the the we can take the first order term right first order term is the power one right so this is what i have done and if i take that i can 
simplify further that is what I was telling simplify further and then and if I simplify further I already have a delta t here and here again t r minus t is delta t but there is a minus sign because t minus t r is delta t. So, t r minus t is minus delta t. So, this becomes delta t whole squared by the transformation temperature t remember this is t t r. Huh? So, this is something so it is t t r is the transformation temperature or the temperature um, sometimes t t r can be replaced by t boiling but t b which is basically the boiling point which is basically the equilibrium between uh, the liquid phase and the vapor phase or it can be melting point which is the uh, equilibrium between the, uh, the, the, the solid phase and the liquid phase. So, in this way I can basically write delta mu as a function of delta H naught, delta H naught is the, uh, the, enthalp the, 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 the enthalpy of transformation uh, difference in the enthalpy of transformation right at the standard state calculated the standard state and the difference in heat capacity right there is a difference in heat capacity and then there is this delta t and this is t transformation right. So, and then there is also delta v m 0 delta p right. So, this is how we can calculate delta mu and from delta mu I can calculate the driving force because driving force is proportional to delta mu. Now, I will come to a very interesting uh, con concept which is called order of a phase transition, right, order of a phase transition. Again, I am considering a phase transition from alpha to beta or beta to alpha, beta can be the liquid phase, alpha can be solid phase, uh, right, alpha is say, say for example, alpha is solid, beta is uh, liquid, then the phenomenon that we are talking about is melting. Uh, again, if it is alpha is the liquid phase and beta is vapor phase, then the phenomenon that we are talking about is boiling or evaporation. Okay, or alpha is solid and beta is a vapor, then it is like we are talking about sublimation. So, now as you can see here, mu beta represents the molar free energy of the beta phase for a unary system, right. Mu beta represents the molar free energy of the beta phase for a unary system and mu alpha denotes the molar free energy of the alpha phase for a unary system. Now, if you see del mu beta del p minus del mu alpha del p is nothing but molar volume of beta, the difference in molar volume of beta between molar volume of beta and molar volume of alpha. Molar volume of beta can be more or less than the molar volume of alpha and that we can think of delta Vm and this delta Vm at the transformation temperature, right, at the, so this is like a delta Vm due to transformation. So, this is delta Vm due to trans, the phase transition that has taken place. So, delta Vm with a superscript here, I am indicating that. Similarly, I can look at the variation of this uh, molar free energy with respect to temperature. So, for each phase, so you have del mu beta by del T as a, at a fixed pressure minus del mu alpha by del T at a fixed pressure, which is nothing but minus S m beta plus S m alpha which is again delta S m transformation or delta S m transition. Now, this delta S m is again related to the, the enthalpy of transformation that is delta H m the, the molar enthalpy of transformation divided by the, the transition temperature transition temperature. So, this is the transition temperature this is the enthalpy of transformation that is the heat that is uh, means absorbed or given out during transformation from one phase to another. Now, as you know that the delta Vm transformation is not equal to 0 whether you are considering melting, vaporization or solidification. Similarly, delta Hm transformation is not equal to 0, right. All of these are not equal to 0, right. So, if you look at that, you will see one very interesting, uh, one very interesting uh, point means when you plot them, for example, volume, uh, if I plot volume versus temperature, now you see this C is like the alpha phase, say Tm is your melting point, Tm, so I am telling Tm, Tm is your melting point. So, I am talking about a melting transition or a solidification transition. So, Tm uh, can be defined as the melting point or freezing point, you can also call it freezing point. Now, if you see this is your molar volume before transformation, right? This is the alpha phase. This is your 
alpha phase and this is your beta phase and see at this transformation what has happened is that molar there is a delta vm which is non zero right this is delta vm dr right this is the or delta vm melting okay so basically this is the delta vm transformation or delta vm melting it is better to write delta vm tr so this is not zero but you see a discontinuity here so you are seeing a discontinuity in the volume okay you are seeing a discontinuity of volume when you go from when there is this transformation so this is the alpha phase and this is the beta phase or you can think of this as the solid phase and this is the liquid phase and as you can see that there is a jump right there is a jump at the transformation temperature or the melting point similarly for enthalpy so for enthalpy see for example here so from some temperature at start now in this case what i am talking about is like it is like a delta h equal to cpdt so here we can think of this as cpdt now once you have reached the melting temperature there is no sens sensible heat there is no cpdt there is no rising temperature right so basically what has happened is you are at tm but now you are changing the phase that is from solid so this is say for example cps so if i think of this this is basically cp s that is solid phase dt and this goes up to the transition temperature now at the transition temperature again there is a jump and you get say cpl right so 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 you see here the first derivative of chemical potential right the h is or vm vm or delta h these are all first derivatives of the chemical potential or first derivatives of the molar free energy and those are discontinuous those show discontinuity right so basically if you think of this this is the solid phase then this is cp s dt until the transformation temperature then there is a jump and that jump is basically delta hm tr which we also call as latent heat right latent heat of transformation or heat of transformation and then you have cp l c mm, cp l right so um, uh, look at the enthalpy here so if you see here i am taking that it is a cps and here it is so, so basically the enthalpy is increasing right so so for example liquid has more heat content because li liquid freezes to um, solid then it gives out heat right if liquid freezes to solid so we can easily understand that li the liquid phase will have more enthalpy or heat content than the solid phase however if you look at the chemical potential of the free energy itself only thing that you see is that it varies as a function of temperature this way but the slopes are basically corresponding to this corresponds to say sm alpha this corresponds to the, the slope here corresponds to say sm minus sm alpha and this is minus sm beta right so basically and again this is s by now if you look at the entropy now if you look at the molar entropy sm let us call it sm then again you have this discontinuity right this is the entropy of transformation right so where the first derivative shows this uh, this 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 uh, discontinuity the first derivative of the molar free energy or first derivative of chemical potential shows jump then that those transformations are called first order transformations right those tra transformations are called first order transformations now first order transformations example melting solidification vaporization right so these are so uh, so so these are all examples of first order transformation where um, uh, you will see later there is a theory called landau theory uh, means I, which i'll talk about in the later much much later and there also you can see a far, further further discussion on this first order trans transition Uh, compared uh, with, with a first order transition and second order transitions and higher order transitions now if you look at the first order transition what i told first derivative of the 
fast derivative of the molar free energy or fast derivative of chemical potential will be discontinuous right as you can see that sm if you look at the change in sm if you look at the change in hm or if you look at the change in molar volume you will see that there is a fast derivative these are fast derivatives we uh, molar volume is fast derivative with fast derivative with respect to pressure um, uh, enthalpy or entropy fast derivative with respect to temperature so these show discontinuities now what about cp cp as you know del s del t is cp by t so cp will show so at the discontinuity there will be a very sharp rise in the heat capacity right it will basically go as very to very large value right there will be a dis because this is a discontinuity so it basically goes to as high as infinity right so there is a very large cp at the transition so there is a very large chance a sudden shoot up in the heat capacity at the transition temperature here the melting point so here if we look at melting points and cp goes very very high as you can see here the cp is varying like this and then suddenly it shoots up like this and then it comes back and it follows this so at the melting temperature you can see there is a cp is the second derivative right this is the second derivative we have shown that right del for example del mu del t is minus s and del s del t is basically cp by t so del 2 mu del t square equals to this is something that we have discussed that del 2 mu del t square is basically going to be so if I look at del mu del t p is equal to minus s and del 2 mu del t square at constant pressure equals to del s m again I can think of this as s m del s m del t which is equal to c p by but there is a minus sign. So, so, so this is basically this is a minus sign, right? Del mu del t is minus s. So, this is minus C P by T, right? <coughs> there will be a minus sign here. This is something that we have shown earlier also. So, do not forget the minus sign because there is a minus sign here and as you know del s m del t uh, del t temperature t is here capital t temperature is no and at constant pressure this is equals to c p c p is molar heat capacity by temperature right so basically del 2 mu del t square again at constant pressure is minus of Cp by T, right. So, and at T equal Tm as you can see, it basically shoots up, right. It shoots up to a very large value. Now, if you look at second order phase transition, so second order phase transitions are not, um, means, um, means it is not like melting or um, uh, melting is not, it is a first order transformation. Uh, then uh, evaporation is a first order transformation, sublimation is a first order transformation, uh, but um, second order is like conducting to superconducting transition. So, if you think of conducting to super superconducting transition, this is an example of a second order transition. What is a second order transition? The volume versus temperature, if you look at volume versus temperature, you will see that the fast derivative is continuous fast derivative is continuous right it, it, it is continuous here right as you can see here it goes here and then it goes up similarly there is a change but it is continuous right so the enthalpy is continuous right molar enthalpy is continuous chemical potential as you can see here it varies this way very continuously so which tells you that the fast derivative the slope the slope is this tangent this is also continuous right so entropy for example the change in entropy is continuous however if i look at the second derivative it shows discontinuity like cp shows discontinuity so cp there is a discontinuity so in second order phase transitions there is a discontinuity in the second derivative of uh, chemical potential or molar free energy with respect to temperature right so if you can see here that the second derivative shows clear discontinuity and that corresponds to delta cp right the cp of the superconducting state and cp corresponding to the normal conducting states right they are basically different there is an abrupt jump there 
but there is no abrupt jump for example in entropy of transformation or molar entropy of transformation or molar enthalpy of transformation or vol volume of transformation right there is no no abrupt change there these are continuous but cp shows a abrupt change right she cp as you can see here by the nature of the slope that the slope changes right slope changes from one point to the other point so there is a change in slope but the but although there is a change in slope it is continuous but cp becomes discontinuous because of this uh, small kink here right if you see the kink here at the transmission temperature or small change here this change itself is sharp so since it is sharp this since this change is sharp that leads to discontinuity in cp and that is what characterizes um, second order transformation. So, some ferroelectrics also show this paraelectric to ferroelectric transformation that are of second order, right. So, there is yet another transformation, Ren first uh, basically classified it. So, it is called a lambda transition, it is called a lambda transition. In lambda transition, for example, it is like a cubic. So, basically, you have a cubic, cubic crystal, then you it. it uh, cubic crystal means crystal with cubic symmetry it uh, undergoes symmetry breaking and becomes a tetragonal means it becomes a tetragonal crystal that is there is a symmetry breaking in terms of the the crystalline symmetry has broken to tetragonal from cubic it has broken to tetragonal right one of the say cubic for example has three four fold uh, rotations but uh, tetragonal will have only one four fold rotation right so basically there is a symmetry breaking and this type of symmetry breaking transition often is called a lambda transition because although the first derivatives are continuous the cp shows the change in cp mimics very much of the first order transformation so it goes very high it goes to infinity at the uh, transformation temperature it goes very high the cp abruptly changes to very high uh, to very high value means basically uh, cp approaches infinity at t, t equal to t lambda and then again it falls back right so and it shows this lambda like appearance right it lambda basically is represent this way, right this is how we uh, write lambda so this exactly this cp follows this lambda type of a curve where there is a shoot up at the transformation temperature so so we can basically now use this information so basically for uni unary systems uh, using this uh, unary system thermodynamics we could uh, classify different types of uh, phase transformations or phase transitions right so for example first order transition which is like melting evaporation etc then there is this conducting superconducting transition which is a second order transition where the second derivative is discontinuous and then there is yet lambda transition where first and second derivatives need not be discontinuous however uh, lambda transition is a very special type of transition where CP, although the first derivative is not discontinuous, CP shows a uh, behavior which is very much similar to that of the first order transition. Okay, so how does the chemical potential change? As you can see, that for example, below TM solid, solid. So if if you look at the solid uh, curve here, if you look at the solid curve here, this is your solid and then this is your liquid so liquid has a higher energy gases even higher energy so solid has the lowest chemical potential or solid has the lowest molar free energy and therefore solid is extent then uh, beyond tm liquid becomes the lowest energy state right liquid becomes the lowest energy state and you go further above boiling point gas gaseous state becomes uh, more and more uh, favorable right so basically as you know del mu del t equal to minus s or minus sm right and s gas is greater than s liquid and s liquid is greater than s solid in general right so all this basically as you can see the slopes also from the slopes you can see that s gas is much steeper than s uh, solid for example right so so the, the uh, if you characterize the slopes here this is one slope this is another and this is the other one and it's very very steep right so this is changing chemical potential so i have just for simplicity i have drawn with uh, approximated them using straight lines now think of melting as a function of applied pressure so you can see now if you know uh, this <coughs> change in chemical potential or change in molar free energy as a function of pressure at constant temperature which is equal to molar volume now think of different cases say for example when you have this is your mu solid now see i have drawn a parabola here 
and I'm also approximating with theta slightly curved. It's like a parabola, right? So this uh, this guy and this guy basically represents so this mu solid is this one. So basically below Tm, below Tm, solid has a lower chemical potential or molar free energy than the liquid, right? Now let us assume that Vm liquid is greater than Vm solid. Now, if Vm liquid is greater than Vm solid and you know del mu del Pt, which is the slope, is equal to Vm. Now, Vm liquid is greater than Vm solid, right? So, basically, if you look at that, if I change, if I change the pressure, if I change pressure, for example, so I am increasing, so this is my Tm, this is my original Tm at say 1 bar, okay? The yellow lines correspond to this yellow lines, basically these lines these ones this one and this one or this temperature corresponds to some some pressure but now if you think of this if i if vm liquid is greater than vm solid and the del mu del p uh, at a fixed temperature for example at a fixed temperature will be vm and vm liquid is greater than vm solid now as you increase pressure the 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 shift in the liquid free energy or molar free energy will be much greater than that of the solid right because vm solid is smaller than that of vm liquid so the sh with increasing pressure so this is like increasing plus delta p with increasing pressure right plus delta p you will see that the solid energy that is the solid guy the solid free energy will shift much less right because vm solid is small compared to the liquid. Now, if that is so, if I again draw this, so if I again try to intersect them because the intersection point is the point where they have equal chemical potential that is mu solid equal to mu liquid. So, that is the, that marks the transformation and that is, that gives me the transformation temperature. Now, you see, if I increase pressure, then this curve shift to the right, the intersection point shifts to the right it is shifting to the right that means that means with applied pressure melting point will increase if vm liquid that is the molar volume of liquid is greater than that of solid molar volume of liquid is greater than that of solid then the mol the, 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 the change in energy or change in chemical potential will be much steeper for the liquid than that of the solid as a result the melting temperature or the transition temperature will shift to the right right uh, to the right of the original melting temperature so is a, as i increase pressure it will shift to the right right so it will melt at a higher means it, it uh, so basically the the solid will melt at a higher temperature now if right the solid will basically this melting temperature increases means solid will basically melt at a higher temperature so solid retains means it, it retains its solidity means it retain it remains solid till a lo, means it, it it remains solid beyond tm right so if there is an increase in pressure on the other hand if you think of so this is the point so uh, if you look at this now this is molar volume of solid and this is molar volume of liquid now i am thinking of molar volume of solid to be greater than that of liquid now think of one common example where molar volume of solid can be greater than molar volume of liquid. If molar volume of solid is greater than molar volume of liquid, what does it mean to density? Okay, and we have done this example. So please try to so this ice water transformation. So have a carefully have a look at it and see this 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 very interesting phenomenon. See here this mu. This is again the the, the molar free energy or the chemical potential that is plotted along the y-axis against temperature. Now if you see here the volume of solid, right? Here the volume of solid, volume, molar volume of solid or volume per mole of solid is greater than that of liquid. As a result, the solid shift that say for example, this is my original curve. This is my original curve, okay? Original solid free energy or solid molar free energy. But now because the molar volume of solid is much higher than that of the liquid, now, with an increase in pressure, if I have some pressure, then the solid free energy will shift to a much higher value, right? Solid free energy shift more and the liquid free energy will shift only slightly, right? This is the original liquid. So, this is the, this yellow line represents the original liquid free energy curve 
and this is the slight change in the liquid free energy curve as a uh, function of pressure right if the pressure is increasing this way then the that for each temperature right del mu del p uh, at each temperature basically it will give a much smaller rise than the solid so if that is so now if you look at the intersection the original intersection was here now the intersection has shifted here so original intersection was at this temperature now it has shifted to this temperature right this temperature so this at this temperature so it has shifted here when it was originally here right when there is an increase in pressure so if the molar volume of the solid is greater than that of the liquid then the melting point is depressed or melting point decreases with increasing pressure if i apply more pressure the melting point will decrease right so this is very interesting very simple thing but you just have to apply your logic and you can understand that and remember when i am talking about mu the slope is what is changing right the del mu del p t that means at a fixed temperature the derivative of the uh, chemical potential as a function of pressure is the molar volume and that molar volume basically that means it, it, if you have a mu versus t curve in the um, at each t the, the 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 at each t um, if if you have a mu versus p curve then, um, then, then the slope basically if you have a mu versus p curve then the slope basically gives you vm but here at each t if you think of this that the solid has more molar volume than liquid so as a result the solid curve will shift more right because see this is where see although if i draw mu versus p then volume molar volume is a slope however when i am drawing mu versus t then at each temperature right, at each fixed temperature there is a change in molar volume if molar volume of solid is more than that of the liquid obviously the magnitude shift of the solid will be much more than that of the liquid and immediately you can follow that any temp at any temperature if that happens then basically the, inter the original intersection point starts shifting to the left right this is a very interesting and very mm, very interesting conclusion of the uh, discussion and of the property right that change in molar volume with respect to pressure at any given temperature is equal to the molar volume and if the molar volume of solid is greater than that of the liquid think of what what is the relation between densities again density see if you have a single component system or a pure system then your molecular weight remains the same and molecular weight by molar volume basically gives you density so now if density if, if molar volume of solid is greater than that of liquid is the solid lighter than liquid or not and if if that is so then in such a case how will the melting point change as you increase pressure right and the pressure increase is given by these arrows right so you can see the pressure increase is indicated by how much the free energy or how much the molar free energy will shift right the molar free energy will shift slightly here for liquid because vml is much much smaller than that of solid right and as you can see here that's why um, in such a condition the tm shifts to the left right so for example think of this example quickly rho ice is 0.917 and rho water is 0.999 so as a result if you look at this vm is now m by rho now if you uh, so if you if you look at the delta mu of ice then delta mu of ice basically you have del mu del p t equals to vm and delta p here i am taking two bar and one bar temperature i have taken as zero degree celsius pressure is increased from one bar to two bar right pressure is increased from one bar to two bar so basically the delta p the change in pressure is one bar right which is basically 10 to the power 5 pascals and del mu del p at any fixed temperature is equal to vm and vm is calculated from m by rho so now delta mu right delta mu by delta p at any given temperature is equal to so it is at zero degree celsius we are looking at so del mu by del p is equal to vm right so del mu ice is basically coming out to be 1.97 joules per mole and that of water comes out to be 1.8 joules per mole and if that is so you find out what happens to the melting temperature right delta mu ice that is the change in ice is the, the change in uh, chemical potential of ice is 1.97 while that of water is 1.8 so water basically uh, increases slightly while ice uh, uh, changes by a lot of amount so basically in this case the melting temperature will shift to the left with increasing pressure 
Now, you can think of apply the same thing like applied pressure on the vapor pressure of a liquid. And in that case, you can think of assumptions like dissolution of, say, for example, you have a pressurizing gas here. So, this is your pressurizing gas and there is a liquid and on the liquid there is this vapor because there is a liquid vapor equilibrium. So, there is, so basically this space in the container contains the inert pressurizing gas plus the vapor. But see, we are neglecting this, the dissolution of pressurizing gas in the liquid is neglect, is ignored because if we do not ignore it, dissolution of pressurizing gas can change the property of the liquid completely or the nature of the liquid completely. Also, there is something called gas solvation or attraction of liquid molecules by gas phase molecules, which is again being ignored here, right? Now, if the vapor pressure in the absence of pressurizing gas is Pi, if it is Pi, I want to see if there is a pressurizing gas, what happens to the vapor pressure? So, you, my applied pressure is delta P, my applied pressure is delta P, my original the vapor pressure is Pi, right? Pi is my original vapor pressure in the absence of the pressurizing gas and again note the assumptions, right? Now, if you in such case at the liquid vapor equilibrium as you know mu liquid has to be equal to mu, uh, mu basically is the molar free energy of liquid has to be equal to the molar free energy of the gas, right? Again, it is a unary system. So, d mu that means the change in molar free energy of liquid or the differential change in molar free energy of liquid has to be equal to d mu uh, that of gas, right. So, basically mu liquid equal to mu gas from here it follows, from here it follows this relation follows. Now, d mu L is V m d p, right, V m liquid d p and d mu G is V m gas d p, right. Now, assuming the vapor to be an ideal gas. If you assume the vapor phase, the vapor phase on liquid to be then ideal gas, often that is a valid assumption. You will see that V m can be written as R t by p. It can be written as R t by p. So, if it is an ideal gas, then obviously V m is R t by p, right. So, now you have the change in mu for the gas phase, which is R t by p d p, which is equal to change because at equilibrium it is equal to the change in uh, molar free energy or chemical potential of the liquid phase which is equal to VML dp. So, basically you have VML, VML let us assume that VML does not change with right the, the molar volume of the liquid does not change with pressure. So, Pi and this is Pi plus delta P right it starts with Pi, Pi is the original vapor pressure then, then there is the pressurized gas and that as a result the, 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 the pressure above the liquid has changed to Pi plus delta P. But here if you see Pi has gone to P, P is basically, um, so Pi has gone to some value P. So, if I look at this, so basically and P minus Pi is basically delta P. So, ln P by Pi equals to Vm liquid by Rt delta P, right, immediately you can see that. So, the pressure you can write the, the change in pressure change in vapor pressure basically here the change in vapor pressure equals to is related to pi times exponential right so you have an ln exponential right here is a logarithm sign and here is this delta p and we know the delta p so as you can see the vapor pressure will increase by this amount pi times e to the power vm uh, liquid that is molar volume of it is proportional to the, so it, it, it will exponentially vary, uh, vary, vary with the change in uh, with, with delta p uh, and it is uh, balanced by rt right if we assume the vapor to be an ideal gas. So, as you can see here ln p by pi equals to vml by rt into delta p. So, basically p equals to pi e to the power right e to the power vml delta p by rt. Right. This is how the vapor pressure will change when there is a inert gas pressurizing the liquid. Now, think of another thing. So, if you have a unary system, you can have a, you, you can basically map the stability like where solid means in which ranges of pressure and temperature solid will be stable, at which ranges liquid will be stable, at which range, at what range gases will be stable. So, for example, you have these white lines, right, these lines, uh, white or you can think of this. So, these, these are the, this is a phase boundary, this is another phase boundary and this is another phase boundary and this marks the triple point where solid, liquid and gas can coexist and these lines are basically phase boundaries 
which basically separate two phases, right? For example, this line separates liquid phase from gas phase, this line separates solid phase from liquid phase, and this line separates from solid, solid phase from gas phase. And as you can see, the axis is a pressure temperature. See, we have used, we can use different types of diagrams like mu T diagrams and all, but this is called a pressure temperature diagram or a phase stability diagram, right? It gives you the stable phases. It maps the stable phases. But as you can see here, please note, this is an interesting point. If you have a single solid, like if it, this entire area, this entire area occupies a solid phase, right? Solid phase is stable in this region. Now, in this area, only liquid phase is stable and in this area, gas phase is stable. However, when three phases are, so basically a two-dimensional area is representing either a solid phase or a gas phase or a liquid phase. While a point represents an equilibrium between solid, liquid and gas, right? All of this, so this point is called triple point at which solid, liquid and gas can coexist. Again, this is a line and along this line, solid and liquid are in equilibrium, right? Two phases. So, basically the line represents two phases, point represents three phases. So, for a unary system, a point represents three phases or coexistence of three phases. A line represents coexistence of two phases and area represents existence of a single phase, right? So, as you can see, TTR, PTR is the triple point or sometimes I write it as say for example, T3 and P3. So, this is a triple point. So, this triple point for a unary system basically means that point or that, so you can call this T, you can call this P3 and this you can call as P3 and this is the point, this pressure and temperature corresponds to, so corresponds to a point where solid, liquid and gas can exist. But see, where the coexistence of three phases gives you a point, coexistence of two phases gives you a line, you can see the dimensionality in the phase diagram and um, Existence of a single phase is basically represented by an area. Why is that? So, for that, to, to understand that, another thing, please note, say when Vs minus Vl is get equal to 0, so this is something that you please try to find out why I have given enough hint. So, Vs minus Vl equal to 0, you see it is basically parallel to the y-axis, right? This, this phase boundary, this phase boundary that you have between solid and liquid is parallel to the y-axis. However, when solid is greater than means solid is greater than liquid that is this is the condition that means volume of liquid is less than that of the solid molar volume of liquid is less than the solid then you see the tilt towards the solid right so you can see the phase boundary which is tilted this way right which represents some sort of a negative slope on the other hand when vl is greater than vs you have a positive slope as you can see here right the phase boundary has a positive slope with respect to axis right again this is the triple point, so I can call it P3 and T3 right, so P3 and again here it is, this point is called P3 and let us call this T3, so that you do not get confused with the transition temperature, so this is the so, P3 and T3 represent this point and this point is the coexistence point. But please have a note of the slope of the phase boundary between solid and liquid. When Vl is less than Vs, then it is inclined to, it has a negative slope. And if it is greater than, Vl is greater than Vs, it is a positive slope, right? And when Vl equal to Vs, then basically, uh, which is very rare, which is very hypothetical case, you will have uh, solid liquid boundary which is parallel to the axis. Now I will discuss why this area, why single phase is in a unary system. In a unary system means it is a single component system, right? Component number of components equal to 1. Number of components in a unary system. So if I think of number of components in a unary system, that is equal to 1. Now in such a case, you have uh, single phase existence is present by an area, two phase coexistence is present by a line and three phase coexistence is present by a point, right? You have seen that. Now, why is it so? 
so the answer lies in the uh, in the the equilibrium that we consider right in a simple system the what are the equilibrium we have considered temperature thermal equilibrium the temperatures have to be equal across all phases and then uh, pressures have to be equal that is mechanical equilibrium and the chemical potential of each species in each phase the across all phases have to be equal right chemical potential of say if i have a component 1 then, chem then chemical potential of component 1 in phase alpha should be equal to uh, that in phase beta should be equal to that in phase gamma if alpha beta gamma are in equilibrium right so now this basically give you the these means this rule this gives rise to this equilibrium gives rise to this rule called Kiss phase rule and we can use this Kiss phase rule to understand degrees of freedom and to understand the structure of a phase diagram like PT phase diagram for a unary system or structure of a phase diagram in a binary system or a multi-component system right. So how does it come? It comes from this idea that if you have say for example let us look at a system of equations. So it comes from the idea of if there are there are only cases if I have to solve this equilibrium conditions then I should have the number of variables which should be exactly equal to the number of equations then only I can exactly solve the equations other than that I will ha either have an over determined system or an under determined system where I can have infinite solutions or no solutions at all right for example if you have many equations but uh, very few variables then your degrees of freedom so basically what I want to define here is the degrees of freedom in terms of unknowns or variables and equations and we will consider linear equations here right we will consider for simplicity only linear equations so you have for example let us look at this so you have three variables x y and z and you have three equations which are linearly independent and as a result you have three equations which are linearly independent and three unknowns or three variables x y z and so basically this equation is exactly so you will have a unique solution to this right so unique solution means degree of freedom df in short df so or you can also call it f so this is equals to number of variables minus number of equations so in this case it is basically 3 minus 3 which is equal to 0. So here what you have is a unique solution to this problem. However, let us think of an equation like a, a set of equations like this x minus y plus 2z equal to 7 and x plus y minus z equal to say 2. Now, in such a case, you have three variables, but you have only two equations. So, you can you have the freedom to choose either x or y or z. So, you can choose some value of x, then you can solve it. And the number of ways you can choose the value of x is infinity. Again, I can choose y and again the number of ways to choose the values is infinity. Again, for z the same. So, basically in this case, the system will have, the system will have, infinite solutions so there is no unique solution or there is no unique equilibrium that you can ascertain in this case so basically here f which is equals to m minus n m is the number of variables and n is the number of equations is basically 3 because you have x y z 3 variables and 2 equations which is equal to 1. So, degrees of freedom is positive 1, it is not equal to 0, right. Now, we can think of another system, for example, I give you a system like x plus y equal to 3, 3x plus 2y equal to 4, x minus y equal to minus 1 and then x plus 7y equal to 11. So, I have four equations, I have two variables. Now, think of this, you have two variables. So, f equals to m minus n, m is the number of variables and n is the number of equations, so which is basically 2 minus 4, which is equal to minus 2. Now, as you can see here, I can take any two equations and solve, but it does not, it may not satisfy, the solution may not satisfy the third equation or the fourth equation. So, in such a case, you have basically in, in an ordinary approach, if you do not use a least squares approach, there is no solution to it, right? There is no solution. So, you have no solution. So, and degrees of freedom is 
minus 2, right? As you can see here. So when degrees of freedom are 0, then only you have a unique solution. Otherwise, you do not have a unique solution. Either you have infinite solutions or you have no solutions. So just apply the same concept, supply the same concept to a multi-component, multi-phase system. Now multi-component, remember we are talking about unary systems, but we will generally define a multi-component system, obtain the Gibbs phase rule, then we will apply to two uh, uh, one component systems. But for, as an example, I can take, take one component in a multi-component system, one component is one of the systems and two phases. Now if you have one component and two phases, then you have three equations, T alpha equals to T beta, P alpha equals to P beta and mu alpha equals to mu beta, right, at equilibrium, right. These are the equilibrium conditions and this gives you three equations. But what are the unknowns? T alpha is unknown, T beta is unknown, P alpha, P beta, mu alpha and mu beta, these are basically not, these are the energies themselves, right, this, because it's a single component system. You cannot think of chemical potential of component one, keeping other components constant. So basically you have only four variables, but you have three equations. So degrees of freedom, basically, so one component, two phases, degrees of freedom is one. Right? If you have one component, two phases, degrees of freedom is 1. Right? Now, think of two components and two phases. So, you have two components, right? Like 1 and 2 are the two components. Then, you have this equation, right? Com the chemical potential of component 1 in alpha equal to chemical potential of component 1 in beta when alpha and beta are in equilibrium. Similarly, for component 2 and then you have P alpha equal to P beta and T alpha equal to T beta. Now, if you see, if I solve these two equations, what I basically get are the compositions, right, compositions of the alpha phase and beta phase. Now, if you see, the compositions can be expressed in terms of mole fraction of component 2 and if it is so, mole fraction of component 1 in each phase can be obtained from the mole fraction of component 2 because x1 alpha plus x2 alpha equal to 1. Similarly, x1 beta plus x2 beta equal to 1. But we do not know x2 alpha which is in equilibrium with the beta phase, right? x2 alpha equilibrium, we do not know. Similarly, we do not know what will be the composition of B in the beta phase. Which is in equilibrium with alpha phase, right? So, we do not know that. So, basically we do not. So, there are two unknowns here. So, we can see two unknowns here, not four because x1 plus x2 is equal to 1, right. In each phase, the, 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 the component 1 and component 2, if it is a two component system, then the mole fractions of component 1 and component 2 in each phase will add up to 1, right. So, if I know one, then I know the other, right. So, basically the independent variables, so what are the independent variables? We have two variables here, we have T alpha T beta and P alpha P beta. So, total six variables and if you see I have one equation, two, three, four. So, four equations, so if you have two components, two phases, you have uh, 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 two components and two phases, you have degrees of freedom which is equal to two, right. Now, think of one component, three phases, like the triple point, right. If you have one component, three phases, then you have mu alpha equals to mu beta equals to mu gamma, this gives you two equations, p alpha equals to p beta equals to p gamma, two equations, t alpha equals to t beta equals to t gamma, the equations are calculated by counting the equal to signs, right. So, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 equations. So, 6 equations and what are the variables? Again, it is a single component system. So, mu alpha equals to mu beta equals to mu gamma does not really give you any mole fraction, right. It is for us one component. So, what are the variables? P alpha p beta p gamma and t alpha t beta t gamma. So, basically you have 6 variables and you have 6 equations you have degree of freedom equal to 0. As you can see our triple point is unique and it is a unique point. So, immediately you can see the, 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 the it is a unique point. Similarly, when I tell one component two phases I have a degree of freedom 1, 1 means basically a one dimensional line which is basically a uh, one dimensional a curve which is basically a line, right, which is basically the phase boundary which has two phase coexistence, right. Now, look at a more generalized description that we have like P phases, you have P phases and you have C components. So, you have P phases and you have C components. Now, what are your equilibrium? We have uh, for subsystems or phases, 
the same uh, equilibrium applies if you are considering simple a uh, simple system so you have t alpha equals to t beta equals to, so if all of these phases are in equilibrium up to p then you have t alpha equals t beta equals t gamma equals to up to t p and see you have p phases so you have p minus 1 equations right similarly for p alpha p beta p gamma up to p uh, with superscript p right because superscript p is denotes the number of phases so basically uh, the total number of phases is, so this is phase p right this corresponds this is phase p this is phase gamma this is phase beta this is phase alpha the pressures have to be equal right across all phases right uh, when there is mechanical equilibrium right so then here also you have p minus 1 equations similarly for each species say if you have c up to c species like 1 2 3 up to c then you have mu 1 alpha equals to mu 1 beta up to mu 1 p again p minus 1 equations so for all components if you have that you have c components so you have c times p minus 1 equations and then these two equations are there so uh, 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 sorry these two rows uh, the, these two rows are also there which will also have p minus 1 equations so you have these two here so you have these two and you have this so 2 plus c so total c plus 2 rows are there and each row contains p minus 1 equations so total number of equations n equals to p minus 1 into c plus 2 right p minus 1 into c plus 2 now see you have component 1 up to c right again if you see any phase x1 x1 alpha plus x2 alpha plus x2 c uh, sorry x c x c alpha x c alpha x c alpha so c components are there is equal to 1 that means one of the components you can choose any one of the components to be dependent and all others are independent so if you have that you have t alpha to t p right t alpha to t p these many variables then p alpha to p p and then x 2 alpha x 3 alpha x c alpha similarly x 2 beta x 3 beta x c beta similarly x 2 p x 3 p x c p so basically if i write it for phase alpha the number of components are t alpha uh, the number of variables are basically t alpha p alpha x 2 alpha x 3 alpha up to x c alpha for phase beta t beta p beta x2 beta x3 beta xc beta right so 2 3 see i haven't included 1 because i have taken 1 as the dependent component right now for phase p also you have tl tp pp x2 p x3 p up to xc so for each phase for each phase the number of variables are two variables are here and here this will be if if x1 is included it becomes c variable say 2 and c but x1 is a dependent variable so i am taking only the independent variable so 1 2 and all these c minus 1 variables so you have 2 plus c minus 1 which is c plus 1 variables for each phase but that means the number of variables for each phase if you have c plus 1 variables for p phases we will have p into c plus 1 variables now it becomes very easy I can find degrees of freedom as number of variables minus number of equations, number of variables minus number of equations, which comes out to be, if you just simplify this, C minus P plus 2. If temperature and pressure both are taken, then it becomes C minus P plus 2. However, for condensed phases that is solid and liquid, often we ignore pressure and if we ignore pressure, then the degrees of freedom will become F equals to C. For condensed phase systems, that means there is no gaseous phase, the pressure, the pressure term, the pressure volume work is neglected. In such a case, the F can be written as C minus P plus 1. We are not considering pressure as a variable at all. We are always assuming the pressure to be equal everywhere. Right, if it's a purely condensed phase system, that is, it contains only solid phases and liquid phases, no gaseous phase. Right, as soon as there is, as soon as we have a gaseous phase, we cannot really use C minus P plus one, but we should use C minus P plus two because in gases, PV work is not negligible. Right, so again, this is a diagram of a single phase. Um, uh, this is a single component system. Uh, so it's a single component system, and this single component system is pure water. And H2O can basically exist as ice, it can exist as water, 
this can exist as vapor so please look at the negative slope between the ice water line and also look at the phase boundary free the degrees of freedom in the phase boundary ice and water are in equilibrium that is there are two phases right ice and water are in equilibrium there are two phases so f equals to c c is basically one component one minus two plus two so one minus two plus so basically you have one component one component and you have two phases and plus two so f equals two so at the phase boundary which is two minus one which is equal to one right so basically it presents a line therefore it is always a line similarly if you have a triple point at the triple point f equals to you have three phases so minus three and you have one component and plus two this is a unary system so this comes out to be zero so triple point is uniquely determined on the other hand if you look at any single phase then you have one component and only one phase and two degrees of freedom right you can basically specify in this area you can specify one point where you have a at that point you can define a pressure you can define a temperature right so so basically at any point so basically if you have a single phase system you can define in independently pressure and temperature right you, once you fix pressure and temperature then degree of freedom will go to zero unless you fix pressure and temperature in a single phase region it will not go to zero so degrees of freedom will be two which represents a two dimensional area right you have this area right single phase is always so in a unary system or a single component system a single a, 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 a single phase like ice or water or vapor means where i am not talking about any coexistence they will be represented by two dimensional areas because i can independently specify if i can independently specify pressure and temperature but once i have specified these two two degrees then my degrees of freedom becomes zero now i can uni uniquely solve the problem in the on the other hand on the other hand along a line let us look at a line so you have this line where your two phases are coexisting now i can either choose a temperature once i have chosen the temperature the pressure is automatically fixed once i have chosen the temperature the pressure is automatically fixed now at the triple point both pressure and temperature are fixed right you cannot have multiple triple points in a unary phase diagram in a pt unary phase diagram now one very important question we have these slopes but how do you determine what is an equation that determines the slopes what is the equation that determines the slopes so we move on to something called clausius clapeyron equation again the derivation is very simple i'll quickly go through it so if you look at the mu if you look at two phases alpha and beta which are coexisting and this is the phase boundary this is your phase boundary then along the phase boundary mu alpha along the phase boundary so this is your phase boundary along the phase boundary mu alpha equals to mu beta and mu alpha and mu beta are functions of pressure and temperature right mole number because it's a single component so it does not depend on the mole number so d mu alpha is as you know or d mu alpha is nothing but and g alpha equals to g beta and mu alpha is basically molar free energy so or gm alpha equals to gm beta or mu alpha equals to mu beta so d mu alpha equals to s alpha dt alpha pm minus s alpha dt alpha right dg equals to mi minus s dt plus vdp right so this is molar volume this is molar entropy right this is also molar entropy of beta phase this is molar volume of beta phase right this is for alpha phase and you have dt alpha dt uh, corresponding to alpha phase your dt alpha and you have dp alpha dp alpha and dt alpha similarly for beta phase you have dt beta and dp beta now at equilibrium that is at the two phase coexistence you should have d mu alpha equals to d mu beta so you have minus s alpha dt alpha plus vm alpha dt alpha equals to minus s beta dt beta plus vm beta dt beta. but as you know from the mechanical and thermal equilibrium that p alpha has to be equal to p beta equals to p say some p okay so p is say some some value right p alpha equals to b beta equals to p and t alpha equals to t beta equals to t now if that is so i can rearrange so basically what i have done is p alpha and p beta i have put as p and t alpha and t beta i have put as t so then i can write this as so i have vm alpha here i have vm beta here so i can take vm this way 
right so this becomes vm beta minus vm alpha dt and i can take the s beta term this way which becomes positive so s beta minus s alpha dt right so basically what is s beta minus s alpha it is delta s alpha to beta right delta s delta s alpha to beta is s beta minus s alpha this is delta v alpha to beta right so that's what i'm writing so vm beta minus vm alpha is delta vm alpha to beta dp equal to delta s alpha to beta so this is a transformation dt so now you can see now you have this pressure so you have the pressure and temperature axis right pressure and temperature as the axis pressure temperature axis so del p del t right del p so this curve if you look at the slope of this curve right is p as a function of t right the how p changes as a function of temperature is what is plotted now as you can see the slope of this curve is given by at any point is given by del p del t and del p del t or dp dt is nothing but delta s alpha to beta so this is the entropy of transformation and this is the molar volume of transformation that is the change in molar volume during transformation from alpha to beta and this is the entropy of transformation remember again delta s alpha to beta is the same as delta s beta to alpha only there is a negative sign similarly for delta t so this basically these equations are called as clausius clapeyron equation now this equation can be used for all these boundaries like solid liquid boundary for liquid vapor boundary and solid vapor boundary say for example if you use it for the solid liquid boundary then you are considering tm or melting or freezing point tm again is a function of pressure right tm can change the function of pressure we already